Okay, so the topic of today's lecture, I guess what I would call it is estimation. And so if you are um, an electrical engineer and you're interested in kind of communications theory, information theory, you will come across a course called detection and estimation theory. And so kind of what we're talking about this lecture and next, it's kind of like, you know, the very basic uh, bones of detection and estimation, starting with estimation, okay? So the idea here is the, you know, the setup is that we observe the value of some random variable y, and then from that, we want to estimate the uh, value of some related random variable x. So we kind of see y, and we want to estimate x. And the idea is that we don't have direct access to x. All we do is we see y, okay? Um, and so, um, you know, we can't see this directly, so we don't observe x directly. And all we have are, you know, some additional information like the um, conditional and the joint PDFs relating x to y. So clearly, if x and y are independent, then showing me y doesn't tell me anything about x, right? But hopefully, if these two variables are correlated somehow, then I could get some useful information based on y and make a better estimate of what x is, okay? And so the setup is basically something like this, where I've got, you know, x, for example, it goes through some sort of a medium or a channel, like a communications channel. What comes out is y. And then what I want to do is I want to put y through some sort of an estimator. And what comes out of this is basically some function of y, which is an estimate of x, which is why I put this x hat. And so kind of what we want to do is we want to find this function g so that this function, when I apply it to the output y, gives me a good estimate of x, or in some sense, the best estimate of x. And so all we're going to talk about today are different ways of characterizing what does it mean for this estimate to be the best, okay? So, um, you know, we want to find this function g uh, so that g of y is kind of as close as possible or, you know, is the best estimate of x, okay? And so we're going to talk about three or four different estimators that all vary depending on what we mean by best or close to, okay? Okay, so that's the setup. Questions about that? Okay, so um, the first thing that we're going to talk about, and, and a couple of these things are going to be familiar to you from a lecture that we had, I think, before Thanksgiving related to estimating a parameter of a distribution, right? So some of these terms you may have heard before, right? So the first one is what's called uh, MAP estimation, maximum a posteriori estimation. So. This MAP stands for maximum a posteriori. Or, you know, kind of like a posteriori means after the fact. And the setup basically is 
given uh, the value of y, what value of x is most likely to have occurred? Mathematically, this is saying that the map estimator of y is the maximum, it's the x that maximizes the conditional PDF x given y, right? That's like saying, if I know the conditional PDF x given y, I show you y, find me the x that maximizes that value, okay? A different way of thinking about this is that I can plot on this axis um, the conditional PDF of x given y. So I have a function of x. I tell you y and I get a certain thing. And then this basically here is the maximizer of that thing, right? This would basically be the x hat, which is the maximum a posterior estimate. And this here is the conditional PDF of x given that y is some value. Okay? Sorry, I have to remember to scroll up my page a little bit. Question? Say it one more time. What is the word before max? Arg. Arg. So basically it means, it's arg max means the x that maximizes this. So if I just had, um, so if I just have this, the maximum value would be on the y axis, right? If I say arg max, I'm basically asking what is the value on the x axis that corresponds to the maximum, right? So I don't care about the actual maximum value, I care about the x where it happened. Yep, good question. Other questions? Let me see if I can kind of slap my guy up here like this. Okay. All right. So let's just do an example of this. Uh, so remember, I'm going to do this in a discrete case first, um, just because it's a little bit easier to do stuff in a discrete world, right? So let's remember um, this experiment where I, you know, flip the coin three times. X is the number of heads. Y is the position of the first head. Right? And so we had a table like this. This is basically the joint PMF of X and Y. I could have up to three heads, and the position could be 0, 1, 2, or 3. If there are no heads, I said that y was equal to zero. If there is one head, I basically have equal probability of uh, it being in any of these places. If there are two heads, it's twice as likely to be in position one as it was in position two. If I have three heads, it's got to be in position one, right? And so, you know, this is just an example that we've been using for several weeks now. It's kind of a running example of a joint PMF, right? If I were to add up the numbers along here, I'd have the marginal in x, right, which has one-eighth probability here and here, and three-eighths probability here and here. That's just like a normal binomial. And if I were to sum down the columns, I would have basically kind of like a geometric random variable, except it would be kind of truncated, right? So I'd have a half probability here, a quarter, an eighth, and then all the rest of the probability got sucked into this zero location, okay? So this is hopefully a familiar example from previous lectures, okay? And so now, what is the map estimate telling me? The map estimate says, I want to maximize for each value of y the conditional probability of x given y. So let me redraw this to say, okay, if I tell you what um, y is, this here I'm going to draw as the conditional uh, of x given y. That's what these numbers are going to be. And so kind of what I'm going to do is 
draw some dotted lines here and say, I'm going to normalize every column to be a PDF or a PMF in X, right? So if I told you that Y was equal to zero, then my probability would look like this, right? And if I told you that Y was one and I renormalized this column, I would get basically this. And if I told you it was two, I would have this. And if I told you it was three, I would have this. Okay? So every column is a valid PMF. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, given a given value of y, I'm going to choose the x that maximizes this thing, right? So if y is equal to zero, then here, this is definitely the biggest number in this column. If x is equal to one, this is the biggest number in the column. If x is equal to two, you know, it's basically either this or this. So I, I kind of have a tiebreaker, so it doesn't really matter. Say I choose this, and then um, if it's three, I have this. So here, you know, for uh, y equals two, um, you know, I can choose x equals either one or two, right? Doesn't really matter which one I use because they each have the same probability. And so if I were to kind of tabulate this, I would have something that says that the map estimator of y would be equal to uh, one, I'm sorry, zero if y equals zero. It would be equal to x equals two if y equals one. It would be equal to either, you know, I could choose either one or two if y equals two, and I would choose x equals one if y equals three, right? So in this y equals two case, you know, either I could always choose one or always choose two, or I could flip a coin and choose one or two. It doesn't really matter from a probabilistic point of view. Okay, and now I can ask, okay, so that's my decision rule. What's the probability of error? Right, what's the probability that I make a mistake, okay? Well, there are a couple ways of looking at this. You know, one way is computing the probability of error is kind of like summing up the uh, law of total probability, right? This is like saying, what's the probability that I make an error if um, y is equal to a certain value times this probability? So again, the marginal in y, if I were to kind of sum down the rows, I have one eighth here, one half here, one fourth here, one eighth here, just adding down the rows. And so I could say, okay, well, what would this be? If y was equal to zero, I would never make a mistake because there's only one possible value of x. So the probability of error when y is zero is one, and that happens with, uh, I'm sorry, the probability of error when y equals zero is zero. That happens with one eighth probability. When y is equal to one, I'm choosing this guy, so I basically have a 50-50 chance of making an error. So I have a one half probability of error and a one half probability that y is equal to one. Here, again, I have a one half probability of error uh, no matter what I choose, and there's only a one quarter possibility of this happening. And then I have a zero probability of error, and there's a one eighth chance of that happening. So if I add these things up, I get a quarter plus an eighth is three eighths. So this is my probability of error. Or I could just add up um, kind of like the um, parts of the joint PMF that I'm not using, right? So I could also say, okay, well, um, I could say what's the probability of error? It's this one eighth plus this one eighth plus this one eighth is basically these three outcomes. Either way, I would get three eighths. Okay, comments or questions about this? So when you've got discrete random variables, life is pretty easy. You can just make this table, you normalize the columns, and you find the biggest value in every column, and then you read back to say, okay, what value of x does that correspond to? Let's do a 
continuous example. Continuous examples are a little bit more tedious. Um, so one example is um, basically a Gaussian random variable, a jointly Gaussian random variable. So I could say, um, let's suppose that x and y are jointly Gaussian. And to make our lives easier, let's suppose that they have zero mean and unit standard deviation. And then let's suppose they have some correlation coefficient, right? We, were, we talked about this before. The correlation coefficient is somewhere between minus 1 and 1. If it's 0, the variables are independent and uncorrelated. If it's not, then I basically have some sort of relationship between x and y. And so we showed in a previous lecture that, you know, the way I think about this was that I have a kind of a plot of the joint PDF. Remember, I have kind of like these kind of contours like this. This is like looking at the topographic map of the joint Gaussian. And if I said, OK, by the way, y is equal to uh, this thing, right? Then I looked at the um, possible values of x, and I project those down, and I get a PDF in x, right? So we showed that um, the conditional PDF, x given y, was also Gaussian with mean rho y and variance uh, square root of 1 minus rho squared. I believe that's in the previous lecture. So what this is saying is basically, you know, I guess I should uh, have drawn this a little bit better. So basically the idea is that when I push the PDF down onto, you know, I say here's this kind of pro possible ranges of x, the conditional PMF is kind of centered around rho y. So if y is positive, the conditional PMF of x is also, you know, in this drawing, kind of more likely to have a positive mean, right, because uh, y is positive. And so what I would do is I would say, okay, what's the maximum value of this distribution? Well, since it's Gaussian, it's the center point. It's actually the mean, right? So the maximum a priori estimate, uh, if I show you a value of y, the place that maximizes that is rho y. The conditional PDF is largest at the mean. Okay. So this is just kind of a, a setup to show how it works in the continuous world. Now the problem is that in the real world, it's often not so easy to get that conditional PDF, right? So the idea is that, you know, what I would like to know is Number one, how does x change with y, but also what is the underlying uh, probability that x occurred in the first place, right? That's what we're really doing here is, um, you know, trying to take everything that we can possibly ever know about the random variables into account. And in the real world, we don't often have all that information, right? So um, in real life, we uh, may not know or be able to estimate um, this PDF, right? It's often a lot easier to go the other way. So it's often much easier to obtain the conditional that goes the other way around, y given x. So what does that, you know, what do I mean by that? So for example, you know, let's suppose that I'm in kind of a position like I drew in the very beginning where I have, um, you know, x going through some channel to produce y. 
Well, what I could do is I could throw a bunch of X's into the channel and I could observe the corresponding Y's, right? That would let me build up a nice model for the probability of Y given X, right? So suppose, for example, these were bits going through a channel and I put in, you know, a ton of zeros and I saw what the proportion of zeros and ones coming out was, that would let me give a pretty good estimate of the probability of Y flipping from one bit to the other, right? So that's easy to do kind of if I have access to my system. The problem is that then I take that system out into the real world and maybe I don't have a very good estimate for the underlying PDF of X, right? Because when I was doing my experiment, I was pushing those X's in myself, but maybe I don't know what the real distribution of X is, right? So um, let me just kind of write down what I just said. So um, one way I could do this would be to um, put a lot of X values into the channel or the system that I've got, and I can build this f of y given x, right? If I was able to do that, what I could do is I could try to flip it around with Bayes' rule and say, okay, then the probability of x given y, which is what I want for map estimation, would be this thing that I was able to compute, right, so this is basically observed, um, times this uh, PDF of what I put in, this is basically known during my testing, and then I divide by this thing, which I can also observe as the output of my test. So I could kind of try to do this to get an estimate of this conditional probability, the problem is that, you know, in real life, even though I can control the X's going into my system when I've got the system sitting on my lab bench in front of me, when I, you know, suppose I'm using like a, you know, I'm modeling like a cell tower or something like that, where I could kind of fake the traffic that's hitting the cell tower, when I take that thing out into the real world, the distribution of X may be very different than what it was in my lab, right? Which would throw off my estimate of this. And so um, what I could do instead would be to say, okay, you know, suppose that I don't try to make an estimate of the incoming distribution of X, and I just try to deal with the known kind of connection between X and Y, right? That's called maximum likelihood estimation. That's what we're gonna talk about now. So, maximum likelihood estimation is kind of like saying, okay, what happens when I don't know uh, the underlying distribution of X? So here the setup is uh, given the value of y, which is what I see, uh, what value of x is most likely to have produced it. So this seems a little subtle, right? This is a subtle difference between what we had before, right? So basically here, let me just before I write this down, here the maximum likelihood estimate, which you'll sometimes see as ML or MLE, is the value of X that maximizes the other conditional distribution, F of Y given X. So the distinction is a little bit tricky if I, if I compare this to map estimation, right? So it seems like these are almost the same sentences, right? This and this. And the difference is that, you know, this one is making more of a judgment about the underlying distribution of X, right? Taking into account the underlying PDF of the X's coming in. Whereas here, this is kind of agnostic about what's going on with X, and it's just asking if I, all I knew was, you know, the input-output relationship, what would be my best bet for choosing a value of X given that I see a value of Y? And to, to illustrate the difference, let me just do an example with 
uh, the same coin flipping thing. So um, let's go back to the um, example with the coin flip. And so before I do that, let me just say um, on, the, on the previous page, the distinction with uh, between uh, map and maximum likelihood, just so I have it written down somewhere, is that um, the map estimate takes into account the kind of underlying uh, probabilities of seeing different values of x. Some values of x are more likely than others. That's what the map estimate is using, right? Um, so the ML estimate, the max likely estimate, doesn't take this into account. So basically, again, the map estimate is kind of like a Bayesian thing, right? It is trying to take everything into account using these prior probabilities. That's kind of what the FX is. Whereas sometimes map, or sometimes maximum likely estimation is kind of referred to as using what's called an uninformative prior. Meaning that I don't know what the internal distribution of X is, and I don't really care, right? So if I were to have some sort of uh, value judgment, I would say that, you know, map estimation is better, right? That's what you should be doing. But maximum likelihood estimate is what you can do when you have less information, okay? So the coin flip example is basically saying, okay, let's go back to my um, situation here. So now I want to take my joint PMF table and I want to build the other conditional PDF, right? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, my values of x could be 0, 1, 2, 3. My values of y could be 0, 1, 2, 3. And now what I'm going to put in the table is f of y given x, right? So that means that if I tell you what x is, I want to look at a PMF in y. And so in some sense, what I'm doing is I'm building a PMF for every value of x. So here it's like saying, okay, I normalize the first row and I get 1, 0, 0, 0. I normalize the second row and I get uh, 1 third, 1 third, 1 third. I normalize the next row and I get 1 half, no, I'm sorry, I get 2 thirds, 1 third, right? Because a quarter is twice as big as an eighth. And then I normalize this row and I get 0, 1, Zero, zero. Okay. And now what maximum likelihood is saying is now I look down the columns again, and in every column I take the biggest number, right? So here, this is the biggest number. Here, this is the biggest number. Here, again, you know, either of these guys is the same, and then I hear this is the biggest number. So my uh, maximum likelihood estimate of y would be equal to, um, if y equals 0, I would choose x equals 0. If y is equal to 1, I would choose x equals 3. That's this biggest thing here. If y is equal to 2, again, I'd choose one or the other one. I guess I could just choose 2. doesn't really matter. And if y is equal to 3, I would choose 1. And if I compare that to my, uh, you know, thing over here, you can see that, um, that's different than the maximum a posteriori estimate, right? That's like saying that here, this guy is choosing x equals 3, this guy is choosing x equals 2. So um, this is the kind of conceptual difference where, again, let me just kind of take this guy off. This is the map estimate. So here, this is like saying, if I tell you a value of y, you know, suppose y equals 1, then certainly x equals 3 always results in y being equal to 1. So the ML estimate is saying, well, yeah, that's what you should do, right? I just take the x that is most likely to produce that value of y. But 
This doesn't take into account that the probability of x being 3 is 1 eighth, and the probability of x being equal to 2 is 3 eighths, right? So 2 is much more likely than 3 to occur in the first place, and that's what the map estimate is doing. It's kind of saying, hey, well, actually, even though this is a little bit lower, you should take into account that x equals 2 is a lot more likely to be happening in the background, right? And indeed, if I were to compute the probability of error for this, what would I have? So uh, the probability of error in this case, well, let's think about it. If I go back to my, um, you know, situation, this is like saying that I have, um, again, if y is equal to zero, I'm not going to make any mistakes. If y is equal to one, well, now I have a lot more likelihood of making a mistake, right? Because here, in this conditional case, the probability of this is a quarter, the probability of this is a half, the probability of this is a quarter. So I have three quarters probability of making a mistake if I'm in that y equals one case. Here again, I have a 50-50 chance of making a mistake in the y equals two case, and I have no chance of making a mistake in the y equals three case. And if I add this stuff up, what I get is three-eighths plus an eighth is four-eighths, which is equal to a half, right? And this is bigger than the three-eighths from the map estimate. Right, so the, the ML estimate is definitely going to have a greater error because it doesn't have the whole story, right? Whereas the map estimate is the best that you could do. So here, I've got a slightly higher probability of error. So, again, if I'm looking at the map estimate, I normalize along the columns. If I'm looking at the ML estimate, I normalize along the rows. In either case, I take the biggest number in each column, and that's what gives me my estimate. Okay, so that's the kind of procedure, but hopefully you've got a little bit of intuition from this example. I know it's kind of like hard the first time you see it, but if you do a little more reading and thinking, hopefully it'll be a little more obvious. So comments or questions about this? Let me just do a, the version of the Gaussian to give you a continuous example of maximum likelihood. So let's just take that for a second here. So um, the um, ML example for the Gaussian. So again, if I go back to the setup, the setup was I've got basically, um, you know, zero means, unit standard deviations, some correlation coefficient. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at what is the f of y given x. Again, that's like saying if I tell you what x is, I look at the distribution of y. This, in the same way, is Gaussian with mean rho x and variance squared of 1 minus rho squared. And so if I were to write this out, what is the Gaussian PDF? That's like saying I have 1 over square root of this. Here's my sigma, e to the minus um, y minus rho x squared over 2 1 minus rho squared. And again, now what I want to do is I want to find the x that maximizes this function. So what I would do is I would take the derivative of this with respect to x and set this equal to zero, right? Because I want to find that x value. Uh, so what would the derivative be? I got a bunch of junk I don't care about. It would look something like, you know, two y minus rho x times a negative rho. I guess it'd be, um, you know, uh, e to the minus whatever. I don't actually have to compute the derivative because this stuff doesn't matter. All I'm going to say is I'm going to set this equal to zero. And I'm going to make my x equal the y that I see over rho, right? This is going to be the maximum likelihood estimate. So if I compare this to the map estimate, you know, here I'm taking the y that I see and I'm dividing by rho. Here I take the y that I see and I'm multiplying by rho. So clearly these are different estimates, right? So this, um, the maximum likelihood estimate that I get here is not equal to the map estimate I got, which is 
y rho. So in general, the ML and the map estimates are not the same, right? And again, that's, that's the, the take home message of ML versus map is that generally what you want to be doing is map estimation because they will give you different answers and the map estimate will have a lower probability of error. Okay. So in some sense, this comes back to the, the question about what does it mean for the estimate to be the best, right? So here, my conception of best is gives me the lowest error, right? The lowest probability of error. So that's one way of defining best. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a, a different estimator, and we're going to come up with a different um, way of doing things, okay? So map and ML, we kind of saw before in the context of parameter estimation, um, but let's talk about an entirely different way of estimation, okay? So, you know, what I mean by this is kind of like a different definition of what I mean by best, right? So another way I might want to do things is I want to minimize, this is called minimum mean square um, estimation. or mean square error estimation, I guess. The idea is I want to minimize the expected value of, if I take my function of y and I look at how far off I am from x, right? So kind of the difference here is that here now I'm looking at the values of x, right? So I didn't actually care about that so much in the map and the ML case because, you know, I'm looking at just the probability of certain values. Now I'm kind of actually looking at the numbers that are attached to the random variables, right? I'm looking to say, okay, if I gave you this estimate, how far off am I from the real value, right? And make this number as small as possible. So what I want to do is I want to, um, I want to find, I want to minimize the deviation between the true value of x and the function of y that I get, which is kind of like the predicted value of x um, in an expected value sense. And I want to minimize that over all the possible functions of y that I could create, right? Over all possible functions of x. So it's sometimes called the MMSE, minimum mean square estimate. And this is getting a little bit advanced, right? So, um, you know, you're used to taking, like, derivatives of functions with respect to a variable and saying that equal to zero and finding the variable. This is kind of like a functional approximation thing, something you probably haven't ever seen before in your calculus class, where it's kind of like I want to take the derivative of this with respect to this g, right? How do you even take a derivative of, a, of one function with respect to another function? That's a longer story than I'm willing to tell today, right? Luckily, I can talk about this uh, in a way that doesn't require us to get all the way into, like, deep math functional analysis, okay? So let's, let's take a look at how we can solve this, right? So let's start with an easier problem, okay? So instead of looking at all the possible functions, let's think about, okay, um, you know, let's start with an easier problem. Um, what is the constant C that uh, minimizes this expected value? Right, so suppose in, in this sense what I'm saying is Instead of looking at all the functions in the world, instead, I just want to know for any value of y that I see, 
you're going to come back at me with the same constant c. And I want to find what is the best constant that minimizes this deviation, right? So what I could do would be to just straight out, you know, again, here it's easier to tell how do I take the derivative of this function. Well, it's all I'm doing is I'm taking the derivative with respect to c. So if I say I'm going to minimize over all the possible values of c this expected value, well, this is like um, the expected value of c squared minus 2cx plus x squared, and then I have um, the expected value of, well, actually, since this is a constant, I just take this out, and I have something like this, right? And now I take the derivative with respect to c, right? That's how I minimize with respect to something. I get 2c minus 2e of x equals 0, right? This doesn't have anything to do with c. So the constant that I should choose is the mean, which kind of makes sense. This is like saying, if I had to give you one number to approximate the distribution, I should choose the mean, right? So hopefully this makes sense. Um, you know, if all I had was a single number to approximate x, I should choose the mean, and that will minimize the error, okay? And it turns out this idea is all I need to solve this bigger problem, okay? And I'm going to solve it by using this law of iterated expectation that we talked about uh, a couple weeks ago. Okay. So first of all, I pause and ask questions or comments. Okay. So let's now try to attack this bigger problem. I want to uh, try to minimize this over every possible value uh, or every possible function g. Okay. So how is this going to work? Well, this is the thing I want to minimize. And now I'm going to write it like a double expectation. Right? This is like saying, first, I'm going to fix the value of y, right? And I'm going to minimize the inside of this. I'm going to minimize the whole thing over y. This is basically the law of iterated expectation from earlier. So what does this mean exactly? This is like saying I take the integral of this expected value here, oops, sorry, g of y, minus x squared, given that y is equal to y. And then I integrate that against the PDF of y. So it seems like I'm making it worse. You're just making it worse. So, but actually I made it better, right? What I'm saying here is that if I tell you a value, so, so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to minimize this integral, okay? And I will have successfully done that if I can minimize for every value of y whatever this is, right? So this integral will be minimized. if we minimize this expected value here for every value of y, for each possible value of y. <coughs> 
And now, this is the kind of a trick. This basically says that, okay, in this perspective, you know, if y is fixed, right, y is just some number, that means g of y is just some number. And I want to minimize this thing here. So in some sense, you know, for uh, fixed y equals y, this g of y is just a constant. And now we're back to exactly this problem here. What constant should this thing be, right? And I already know that, right, from the previous um, thing that we just did. This constant should be the conditional expected value of x given that y is equal to little y. So what I actually did was I proved everything that I needed, right? So I, I actually proved that the best function to use if I tell you y is the expected value of x given y, the conditional expected value. And so, actually, that's, you know, that's in some sense the best thing that I could do, right? And it kind of makes sense that if that's what I'm trying to estimate in the first place, that I should use this conditional mean, right? For, every, for, for the y that I'm showing you, I should choose the conditional expected value of x given y, okay? Problem is that this is not always such an easy thing to figure out, right? So you remember, if you go back to your homework somewhere in the mid-teens, and you started to look at computing these expected values, usually they involved integrals and Wolfram Alpha and weird functions, and so that's the kind of thing that if you have the full, you know, the full joint PDF of X and Y, well, yes, you could plug all that in and you could do the computations, right? But again, in the real world, this thing could be some really weird function of Y, right? So um, in practice, this could be messy. Some, you know, likely to be some weird function of y. So the last thing I want to talk about basically is say, okay, uh, okay, I, I, I was going to let you use any function that you wanted, any g that you wanted. Now I realize that that would be potentially a really messy thing to do, right? So let me scale back and say, okay, something between giving you just a constant and giving you any function in the world, let's take a happy medium there. So maybe instead what I'm going to ask is, okay, just give me the best linear function of y, right? A y plus b. And in that case, it's easy to kind of take y and process it to get the estimate of x. So that's kind of the last part is that um, a compromise here is to take the, um, the best linear function of y. That is, okay, I want you to just take the y that you see and find these two constants to minimize the mean squared error. That is, I want to minimize over all the possible A and Bs the expected value between the function that I use to kind of predict X and the actual value of X. And I want to make this as small as possible, okay? So now I have, again, made my life easier to do something where really all I have to do is take the derivative of this function with respect to 
A and B. And this is going to be easier to understand, hopefully, than this more generic, possibly nonlinear function. Okay? So let's kind of attack this. And this is just nothing more than expanding stuff out, right? So let me just rewrite this in a slightly different way. This is like saying expected value of uh, B minus uh, X minus AY squared. Hopefully this should be convincing you that all I did was I just kind of rearranged the parentheses in here. Why is this um, worth doing? Well, again, from before, if I look at this, I can say, well, this is a constant, right? This here is some random variable that depends on x and a and y. I don't know a yet, but certainly I know from before that what I should do here is the best b is going to be the expected value of whatever this random variable is. Right, or a different way of saying this is, is e of x minus a e of y. So if we knew a, I could figure out b, okay? So now I can kind of just like um, substitute in, okay, this b is a function of a, and the best a then is what I'm going to get if I minimize with respect to a the expected value of plugging in what I know about B is um, let's see Kind of a mess, but um, I'm going to collect things together to make this a little bit easier here. I've got uh, the y part, which is y minus e of y. And then I've got the x part, which is x minus e of x. The reason I'm doing this is that hopefully this is starting to look like the kinds of computations we do when we, com when we compute variances, right? So here, now what I have is I've got um, the square of this is going to be uh, a squared y minus e of y squared. Then I have plus a, or I'm sorry, I have minus 2a times this thing plus this thing squared. So all I'm doing is I'm squaring the inside of this thing. And now I am going to um, actually note that, hey, this is equal to a squared. The expected value of this part is just the variance of y. The expected part of the expected value of this part, y minus this, x minus that, this is exactly what we call the covariance of x and y. And then this part is just the variance of x, right? So now life became suddenly a little bit cleaner. And now I take the derivative with respect to a, and I set that equal to 0. I'm going to get 2a times the variance of y minus 2 times the covariance of x and y, and set that equal to 0, right? That means that the best A is going to be um, the covariance of X and Y over the variance of Y. And if I write this in terms of things, you know, a little more symbolic, right, this is like saying the variance of Y is sigma squared Y. The covariance, I could write like the correlation coefficient times the two standard deviations. This would be you know, a compact way of saying it. And then the result would be that I have 
the covariance times this ratio of the two sigmas. So if I bring it on home, what this is saying is that the the MMSE linear estimator for X is, sometimes I call this um, L for linear MSC. Again, it's A, which is this thing, Y, plus uh, B, which is the mean of X minus the A that I got times the mean of Y. This is just basically what I got from here. If I knew what A was, I'm just plugging in the A that I got and figuring out what the, what the right B is. Or equivalently, I can just kind of rearrange things a little bit. It's like saying I take Y and subtract off the mean, multiply it this, by this thing, and add this, right? The nice thing about this is that this estimate only depends on things about the random variables that I kind of already am likely to know. The variance and mean of each random variable and their correlation coefficient, right? So if I give you these pieces of information, which are typically the way that I would characterize a joint random variable, I can compute this linear mean squared error. And so kind of in practice, what happens is that it's the difference between looking at, um, you know, if I tell you why, normally the estimate of, uh, you know, expected value of X, or I'm sorry, expected value of um, X given Y, which is the normal uh, minimum mean squared error, right? This could be some nonlinear function of Y. The linear version is going to be something that is basically like the best linear approximation to this curve. This here is going to be like the linear mean squared error, which is going to be this, um, you know, mess of stuff. And so, in practice, you know, since the linear function is a subset, it, you know, it's, it's only one of the possible many possible Gs, you know, the expected error that I get is never going to be as good as the full MMSE, whatever it is. But hopefully it's not that much different. And so, what you're going to be doing on the homework, which I know you're really looking forward to, is to compute the MMSE and to compute the LMSE and then see what the difference between those two things is, right? And you're, you're gonna find out, hopefully, that they're really not that much different. So you don't lose a lot, necessarily, by accepting a linear estimator. And in practice, as you can see from a lot of stuff that we do kind of in your undergraduate level, we like to make things linear because they're easier to handle, okay? Okay, so what else do I wanna say about this? I think that's a good place to, to stop since I feel like you're probably overloaded already. So I, I realize this is not necessarily the most obvious stuff to get on the first try, right? This is why we have a textbook. This is why you study outside the classroom, as I know all of you are doing, right? But it does take a little bit of learning to figure out how this stuff works, right? But this is a good preparation. If you're interested in taking detection estimation, for example, this is the kind of stuff that you're going to be doing as your bread and butter. So especially those of you that are interested in, like, coterminal degrees in our department, you know, this is the kind of stuff that we're working towards, so. Okay, the good news is that Thursday's lecture is gonna be smoother, and the next lecture after that is gonna be, you know, pretty sweet. So, you know, this is the hardest math that you will have seen, and now we have to kind of move on to the easier math. Okay, see you on Thursday.